to episode 351 of Cinematary. I'm your host, Zach Dennis, and I'm here with Michael O'Malley. And joining us today is our very special guest. You're going to be our Beyonce expert, by the way. Oh my God, that's the best title I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, Ariel Felton. Ariel, thank you so much for coming on Cinematary. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Ariel is, I'm just going to like so qualify you so that, you know, everybody, I'm going to brag about you for a little bit. Okay, lifetime Beyonce fan. Oh, I wouldn't even Number talk about one. that. Ariel is a very uh, published writer. She's been in the New York oh. Times, the New Yorker, the Washington Post, uh, the Savannah Morning News, um, <laughs> and also is a uh, a lifelong Beyonce fan. We they got lemonade over there on the on the vinyl rack. So. Oh yeah, it was a nice Christmas present. It's like yellow. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's that's all we need, I guess, is for like a expert is they have the vinyl record of lemonade on the uh, on their in their <laughs> collection. That that's good enough. <laughs> we had Nathan pull out the VHS for. Um one of our movies last week so this is like definitely next level as far as uh, physical <laughs> objects go i'm happy to grab it so you can see we'll do that in part two we'll save that okay. for part two yeah <laughs> um well we got a we got a good episode today movies that we saw this week in part one and then in part two like we said, we'll be concluding our music video series with 2016's Lemonade by Beyonce. Um, head over to Cinematary.com. We have a new review of Girl Interrupted by a new contributor, Ali Chadwick. Um, but real quickly, we have two uh, listener emails that we want to get to before we jump into movies that we saw this week. <clears throat> so this first one comes from a uh, longtime friend of the pod uh, in Knoxville, not native, but Knoxville person, um, Chuck Campbell. Uh, he says, I listened to your April 16th podcast on music videos, and y'all were really speaking my language. I was shocked how much you knew about stuff before your time, and yes, I know that's sort of y'all's thing. I thought Nathan did an excellent job detailing the evolution of music videos, which I lived through, lol. For me, I think the movie Tommy was on the cutting edge of what became what would become music videos, and Russell did a uh, very vivid job of breaking each song into its own distinct story and a story. Plus, he pulled in actors and uh, uh, Margaret, who was nominated for Best Actress Oscar for her role, plus Oliver Reed, Jack Nicholson, as well as Tina Turner, Elton John, and Eric Clapton. A lot of fans of The Who, of the Who hated the adaptation, but it was definitely mind-bending in its time. I know you hear this all the time from everybody, but you guys should check it out. Um, it sounds like a cool one. I was looking it up after he had sent this to me, um, and I think it's one that we should consider for, for young critics because it seems pretty wild. Have you seen that one, Michael? No, I've not seen either of the like Who movies because I think um, didn't Ken Russell also do the Quadrophenia movie? Mm -hmm. I mean, I've heard both of those albums and I like both of those albums, but I've not watched the movies now. Um, the other one comes from another long-term listener, Ron Hayes. He said, Dear Cinematarians, as one of your oldest listeners in both senses of the word, I rise to congratulate you on having reached 350 episodes. Since discovering Cinematary with number 54, I haven't missed a week yet. I have laughed, I have nodded, on occasion I have rolled my eyes. I believe a time or two I have yelled at my phone in a public place. I have taken comfort in Nathan's assurance that I am not the only adult with a soft spot for Jerry Lewis. I have rejoiced when Ash reminds me that hot bods and nude scenes are fine reasons to love the movies. I have endured Zach's scurrilous attacks on the boomer generation, which I'll be honest, I'm not going to stop. Um... And I have enjoyed his ongoing struggle to speak French and occasionally English. But seriously, thanks to Cinematary, I have been moved to I have been moved to become acquainted with great directors I should have watched years ago: Bergman, Kurosawa, Yajit Ray, Abbas Kiarostami, Yasuhiro Ozu. What I admire most about you, though, is that you all remain as eager to praise as to criticize. Nowadays, I encounter far too many critics who seem to watch a film only for the small joy they take in nitpicking its faults. They presume to tell artists how to do better uh, what they can't do at all. You guys don't hesitate to criticize, but neither do you hesitate to praise. I had no idea what a Daft Punk was, and now that I know, have no desire to know more. But Andrew's articulate enthusiasm for their work made the discussion well worth my time. Your love of cinema, the good, the bad, and the merely mediocre makes you cinephiles in the true sense of the word, and that makes every episode fun. Well, I am old. The first movie I remember seeing as a child was Around the World in 80 Days, the original 1956 version. But ne nevertheless, I am eagerly looking forward to your next 350 episodes and those inevitable series. Uh, Middle-aged critics watch old movies, followed by old movies we think we remember watching this week. <laughs> Sincere congratulations to all, Ron Hayes. 
So thank you both to Chuck and Ron. We appre- we always appreciate the mail. I wish more people would send in stuff, honestly, because uh, we never know who's listening. So <laughs> <laughs> much appreciated. Um, well, let's go ahead and jump into movies that we saw this week. And this one, I think, is one that both Michael and I have seen. It's the latest on... Um, on Netflix, and it is the Mitchells versus the Machines. Um, it's made. It's directed by Michael Re, Re, uh, Rianda, who I guess um, he did the. He worked on Gravity Falls, which is a wonderful animated series that Cartoon Network had a couple years ago. Um, and it's by Sony Animation, who did uh, Into the Spider Verse. Um, help me out, Michael. Um, <laughs> you're you're leading with um, probably the most. Uh, non-representative it's like the the emoji movie the um the smurfs hotel transylvania um cloudy with the chance of meatballs uh a lot of like franchise movies uh like animated movies honestly uh plus these you know these two forays into more ambitious style which are enter the spider verse and then this movie yeah so this one uh i don't think it's not based off it's not adapted from a book or anything is it no not that i know of um i didn't think so i don't Um, think so either but it follows this family who has kind of like their ups and downs and they uh they got to work through family stuff because this uh, this tech conglomerate, uh, voiced by Eric Andre, which I kind of enjoyed. That Eric Andre <laughs> was the voice of the uh, like the the Mark Zuckerberg, Jeff Bezos stand-in. Um, he creates this. Uh, he has created this AI, and so he creates this like a, you know second layer of the AI where they have like these autonomous robots that like are going to help you do chores and all this kind of stuff. Okay. And then the AI that he originally created gets offended. <laughs> and so um, she takes over. She's voiced by Olivia Coleman, and she takes over all of the robots. And like, there's like this whole robot apocalypse thing that they have to uh, that they have to fight through. Um, Abby Jacobson is one of the voices. Danny McBride, Maya Rudolph. Um, but yeah, so this is it. Just premiered on Netflix a few weeks ago. Um, I liked it well enough. I watched it the other day, Michael. I know you were, uh, you were, you know, you liked it as well. What did you, uh, what did you make of the Mitchells and versus the Machines? I, I feel like that my take is pretty similar to what I've seen a lot of people say, which is that I found the screenplay itself to be kind of irritating at parts, but mostly just kind of average. Um, although I think like it does do some things right that I like a lot of movies don't like. I think all of the characters have really coherent, um, like personalities that develop over the movie, which I appreciated, but like for the most part, like it's a really zany, like comedy that I think isn't actually that funny. Um, so like that part's just kind of meh, but I really love the animation, which is definitely like picking up where into the spider verse left off. Um, but instead of having this like, uh, kind of comic booky like effects on all of that, um, like that Enter the Spider Verse was doing, like this is definitely trying to look digital in some ways. Um, and so you get like the same thing that like Enter the Spider Verse was doing with, which is like these like uh, 3D animated characters with like really strong like edges and stuff. So it feels almost like that they are like a kind of traditional like cell hand drawn, even though they're clearly not like, you know, they don't look, lo- they don't really look like that, but it kind of evokes that style. Um, it like does interesting stuff with like the, the number of frames that get animated and things like that um and then it just has this really like just um like eye-catching like really like like the sense of motion just really pops um and so i think like this looks incredible which is like the primary reason that i liked it um and on my letterbox review i went on like a mini little rant like basically saying that like i think we all like have had our little you know, tirades against like CG animation and like, why doesn't people draw the pictures anymore? But um, I I think honestly, like there is genuinely interesting stuff going on in CG animation these days that shows that people are really truly finally unlocking what CG, like what is the, what are the strengths of computer generated images as far as animation goes? And how can we exploit those strengths to make things that we couldn't make in other types of animation. Um, and so we're like over the past like 
six or seven years probably in animation, you've seen like a move away from trying to ape like Disney and Pixar, uh, like with the photorealism and stuff, and going more into how can we make uh, computer generated images look convincingly cartoonish in a way that um, kind of evokes the stretchiness and versatility of like hand drawn, like Looney Tunes, like that sort of thing. Um, but while also using like the really sophisticated lighting and like particle effects and simulations that computers can add. And I think that this movie does like a really interesting job of that. Like these characters all look like completely complete caricatures, like cartoons, but it like works within like an aesthetic that both like recalls like hand drawn stuff. Like it definitely, these characters kind of look like Gravity Falls characters. Like if you hand drew them, they would probably fit pretty well in the Gravity Falls, but you couldn't simply transpose these images into Gravity Falls either. Like this is still like doing something that is uniquely um, computer generated. And I don't know, I thought it looked, it looked really awesome. Um, and like has a really fresh visual style that, like I said, is kind of reminiscent of Into the Spider-Verse, but it's definitely not retreading those grounds. Like it's definitely doing something of its own. Um, and so I really like that part. Um, the, like I said, the, the actual text of the movie, I thought was just kind of average, but, um, yeah, the, the story itself is pretty, <clears throat> is pretty average. And it also has, I mean, we don't have, to, we could dig into it if we want, but it also has one of those very similar to something like, um, onward or mm. it has like this very, um, milk toast representation because technically the lead character is a queer character but you really you don't really wait, engage really? with that see wait how <laughs> can you explain this to me zach I... her they, they, she talks about her her girlfriend at the very very end of the movie and, it, and it, let me just wait is that the person that she's on she's video chatting the whole time yes that's oh man yeah but okay. and I did I just thought that was like gonna be her roommate or something well, like I don't know well that's what I thought and then I saw one they she says that they've been dating like at the end of the literally the end of the movie and two they place this so you know how Netflix um is trying to be like progressive and it has like the Black Lives Matter collection and Representation Matters collections and stuff. And so this was under Representation Matters. <laughs> so I spent half of the movie trying to understand why Representation Matters in this representation case. Representation matters so much that we can mention it once at the end of the movie. <laughs> but it was, it was like literally at the very end of the movie, she goes, oh yeah, so-and-so and I, you know, because her mom goes, how is that going? And she's like, oh, it's going, you know, it's going really well. Like mentioning that they've been dating. And I don't, again, it's, it's whatever. It's just kind of, it's just that silly shoehorned, like we're woke <laughs> crap, whatever. Is that Abby's character? Abby yes. Dick? Okay. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you don't, you don't get any, I mean, I don't know. It's just, it's just set up in a very lackluster way. <laughs> I'm going to watch. I like the post. It's the, like the worth anime, watching. It's fairly, it enjoyable. is worth watching. Yeah. The, so the thing I kind of want to talk about is that it really, it's very, um, I think this is one of the, like, I was thinking about this while watching it. It's very, there, there's a handful of movies recently that I would categorize this under, but it's very much like a part of like very early TikTok movies. And I say that because it's, it a lot of its humor and a lot of like its visual flair, um, less the animation that you describe, Michael, but like just the visual flair of like how it's telling the story is very engaged in the visual language that is utilized on TikTok. You know, it's like, so it's pretty much, it's, a lot of the humor is like supplanting a image or meme that is unrelated to the movie but it's using that like it's it's using that as like the like the foundation of a joke um i mean you have like the whole you have a couple scenes where it's literally engaging with actual memes um (laughs) but it also just has like a couple kind of it kind of supplants like the more traditional like a like a traditional montage with like something that seems more reminiscent of like a of like a tiktok video where um rather than it being like a montage of something kind of building up, it's kind of things like overlapping on one another and kind of in conversation with one another. And I'm not saying this necessarily as a bad thing. Like I think it's just something that we're going to have, that we're going to become more, we're going to see a lot more in movies just because that's the visual language that we're engaging with on a more frequent basis. Um, But it was just interesting to me that like, I guess 
that like the foundation of the humor is based in internet culture which i don't again i don't necessarily say that's a bad thing i'm just bringing that to attention i think another thing that's kind of reminiscent of that is like thinking back to the visual style you get a lot of things that are almost reminiscent of like how someone might use a like a filter or an effect um where there's just kind of like a one-off like visual flourish like we see like um uh, and so, sometimes this is literally like you're seeing the image that is in someone's phone. And so they have like the um, like face alterations or uh, different like, you know, kind of filters that way. But then other times it's like you'll see really briefly there'll be like a shot in which like uh, there's like an overlay on the image. Um, and it's not like a defining like aesthetic of the movie. It's just like for this one section, we're like for like 30 seconds or whatever, we're going to have like, uh, you know, everything look like, um, you know, like it has like thought bubbles on it or something like that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And like that definitely feels like how like not just TikTok, but like Snapchat and stuff like that, you know, have these kind of uh, one off like visual things that you can do that are kind of like just silly and fun. Um, and I noticed that as well. I just, I don't know. Again, like I don't, I'm not saying it like as a bad thing cause I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. It's just, um, it's, I think it's kind of a longer conversation to have about like how that's going to be like the foundation of like of a joke. Um, that like the foundation of a joke is, a is kind of a knowledge of how this joke is set up through the internet um which i don't think is necessarily a like a unique thing i think that's just how you know even just comedy and movies is kind of set up like you understand how a joke is 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 set up and you work from that i mean you can say the same thing um with older movies from just like how somebody you know like a like a jerry lewis like performs in front of people and then like how he performs in the movie like like that's that's a kind of or even like you know chaplin took his like how he performed on stage and implemented that into the movie but i think it's a little bit different because it wasn't I don't think there was like that wide of a knowledge of like oh so this is how charlie chaplin was like on stage and so this is how i'm reacting to him in the movie i felt like a lot of the time when you saw chaplin in the movie that was the first time you were ever seeing him and this it feels like you kind of have to have like this pre-determined knowledge of how an internet joke is constructed does it make sense it it does i Making that – the comparison that I, maybe I would make would be the Marx Brothers who had like a stage and vaudeville career and like transposed some of their jokes from vaudeville um, into their movies. And I think like some of those like going back like do seem to be a little bit like winky as far as like recognizing the familiarity of some of these jokes um, or um, – you know, like some of the personalities like of the Marx Brothers are already kind of in the movies as like foreknowledge. I know like some of that is, is like the, just, you know, as they grew a cinematic presence as well, but then like other parts of it, like um, the like Zeppo uh, plots and stuff like that are very, like oftentimes like very knowingly like put in like, oh, okay, like here comes the Zeppo stuff. You know what goes here. That's true. Like there is like a certain like, uh, evo- like evoking like you know oh the audience knows what this is and we know what this is and so we're just going to kind of like riff on it um, I would say that like I don't really have a problem with the internet humor stuff either but I would like to see a better version of it like this feels like yeah like some of the internet stuff is pretty outdated like they have like the Numa Numa song playing like as a like a big plot point which it's a touch point yeah it's a whole yeah, touch point which, which to be fair the movie establishes as something that the protagonist grew up with um but at the same time it's a strange I don't know like that's something I never no, hear I... younger people talk about uh, is the Numa Numa song like I, I feel like that even predates a lot of their like you know internet knowledge but maybe not but I don't know I guess there's this whole like bit at the beginning of the movie where 
I mean, a lot of movies do this where the protagonist is like, boy, my family, we sure are weird, blah, blah, blah. And then it proceeds to describe a family that seems completely like thoroughly normal to me. Um, you know, like, <laughs> hey, the the daughter is interested in audio video stuff. And so she edits stuff, you know, her own like videos and puts them on YouTube. The dad is more conservative and like kind of like a survival net or whatever. Oh, the mom is, I don't remember what the mom's weird thing is. Oh, the, I think she's the, just quirky. The, <laughs> the brother is you know, kind of rambunctious and has a weird personality that no one can lay a finger on. Like, I guess like, I just, there, there's just like that constant like trope in shows about like, you can relate to this family cause it's weird. But really the reason you can relate to this family is that there's like a universality about it. And I kind of felt that way about some of the internet humor too, where it was like, haha, you know, this is the internet you know, how weird is the internet? Oh, you know, LOL. And like, that's true. The internet has some really bizarre stuff on it, but like the movie was not truly tapping into like the, the like true bizarre ethos of the internet. And it was kind of just like gesturing toward like an idea that like, oh yeah, this is, this is internet humor trademark, but without like truly digging into something that would be more interesting about internet humor, I guess. No, that's that's a hundred percent true, and it's also I think to go back to the comparison you made, like when the Marx Brothers did a a set that was kind of like not set in stone, but like there wasn't the internet moves so quickly that trends change like on a dime, and so like to your point, a lot of the stuff that they're referencing is super outdated. That even like the TikTok people would not understand what the hell they're talking about. And so I feel like maybe that's maybe some of my reservation with the internet humor is that trends on the internet move so like lightning fast that it doesn't translate to a movie that needs to like have more of a general, like, um, I don't want to say like timeless quality, but like just that, like it, I'll be curious. I think the the animation style that you described at the beginning will live on because I think it is super impressive. But I think that the story will kind of wear just because a lot of these references will become quickly outdated, and that's just the nature of the internet, you know. So I agree. Yeah, I like the phrase "TikTok people." <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm I'm already devising like a list of like TikTok movies because I've seen a bunch of them. Um, just in terms of how they're made. Um, What's another example of one? I'm trying to think like what it would be. <sighs> the one I I I put a um I think I put it on Letterbox. The latest oh shit, what was it called? The 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 latest Michael Bay movie, the one with um Ryan Reynolds. That was a TikTok movie. The way it was edited, it was so... Uh, under, was it like the underground something? Yeah. that It was a fu- super fun movie, but I was also just like, this feels like a TikTok movie. It's 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 a work in progress. I'll we'll 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 update that on a later date. I'm just saying this is a very TikTok movie. It was fun though. I like I recommend it. I went. It's I didn't totally love it. It wasn't like I wasn't like oh my gosh. But I agree with Michael. The animation is is really like honestly. I I I enjoyed this animation more than um than uh like something like Soul or Onward, the two Pixar movies from last year. I would say that I like the animation more than those. It's definitely more visionary. Like Soul is kind of like a gentle push towards something new for Pixar, whereas this is like really eager to be something new. Um, and I think that that's like really laudable. That's that's fair. Um, I've talked too much, so I'm gonna Ariel. I'm gonna toss it over to you since you've seen a new movie. <laughs> All right, I'm going to take my headphones out for a minute just because the feedback is like five seconds after me. And it you don't have to listen to Michael. That's sounds fine. a little weird. I will put them in and out, I promise. Um, but yeah, so I finally watched Two Distant Strangers on Netflix. It's a short that I believe um, just won an Oscar it did, yeah. recently. Um, and I've been hearing about it for a really long time, but kind of like avoiding it because a lot of black movies these days are just about black pain and black trauma Mm -hmm. and just putting like the really traumatic stuff you see in the news on the screen and like a beautiful quote unquote way. And I'm Mm -hmm. not, I'm not really down with that. I I would prefer to laugh (laughs) a little bit, um, but it won an Oscar. So I finally watched it and Although I really did love the acting of the main character, um, 
Yeah, I gotta agree with the with the content just being a little too dark for me. So if you haven't heard of it, it's basically like Groundhog's Day meets police brutality. Um, this young black man keeps waking up after a one night stand, I believe, um, mm-hmm. and trying to get home to feed his dog. But every time he goes outside, there's some sort of altercation with the same police officer and he ends up dying either um he's like choked to death he's shot either it happens immediately or he like chases him a block he tries out all of these different tactics but it just keeps happening Mm -hmm. over and over again and um i don't know how we feel about spoilers on this show so i won't like ruin we're gonna spoil stuff you're good okay yeah yeah the ending is just too dark it's just too dark I'm, i'm not sure if there's an ending that I would have preferred, like I'm not, I don't write movies, so I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure what I was looking for. But basically, at the end of the movie, I was left with this feeling of like, there's nothing you can do, and this is just how life happens, and like, this is just your life, and you have to, like, as a Black American, this is what it's going to be no matter how you approach these situations Mm -hmm. um after a while when he wakes up at this young woman's house he's finally he finally tells her the truth about what's going on and so she suggests like oh maybe you should talk to the cop you know maybe that's the the key Mm -hmm. and then we get this very beautiful and like in-depth montage of them riding in a cop car together um he's told the guy he's told the cop like this keeps happening um the cop gives a very like oh i'm interested and i'm listening and i'm just gonna take you home like to make sure that you actually get home to your dog safe and in the car they're talking back and forth he's like why did you become a cop um where do your stereotypes come from where do your stereotypes come Mm -hmm. from and you really like get sucked into this moment of is the point of this movie that we all just need to talk to one another because one bullshit sorry (laughs) i wouldn't have liked that either but then that moment also disappears they get to his apartment um the young man gets out of the car he's riding in the back the whole time um which i just think is gross um he gets out and the cop starts clapping in this very like oh good job like you're such a good actor and then fucking shoots him and it's like what why did i just get I don't know, like, just thrown around for 30 minutes. A little, like, rug pulled out. Right. And just to speak, like, throughout all of it visually, it's got a very rom-com look and feel to it. I mean, he's Mm. got on, like, a... He's a cool guy, right? He's got on, like, a bright yellow hoodie, I think. He's got on, like, the Malcolm X glasses. Like, he's... um, I don't know. He's very, there's, there's humor in it when he's talking to like the young woman in their apartment. The whole vibe is like mm-hmm. friendly and funny, but there's very, very vicious <laughs> and brutal scenes of him like dying at the hands of this cop. It was a very emotional roller coaster. Well, I, and I, and I told you about it, but um, so I, I guess allegedly this was initially stolen by so this woman directed it for and like directed it and then around the time of the george floyd killing um now this news picked it up or, or reached out to her and was like hey um can we like we really you know moved by your by your short film mm-hmm. um can we like share this on our social media, et cetera, et cetera. And so this woman, um, like said, yeah, it's fine. And it appeared like on their Twitter, it appeared on on their Instagram, things like that. Um, and then when this movie came out on Netflix, she noticed that now this news was like a producer behind it. Mm -hmm. Um, so this woman who is Asian American, then she was taken to task because I guess the idea was was uh, stolen from somebody else who I believe was black. So it was it's just like this whole like the whole thing is just like the whole thing was fucked pretty much. Um, hmm. So, yeah. And I, I don't know, like I know that this has become a very popular thing to make movies about. Right. Like Jordan Peele's Get Out worked. Yeah. But it's not that it doesn't it doesn't have the like the nuance or the humor or the shock of of get out. It's just 
It's like the same way I feel about Handmaid's Tale when I yeah. when like girlfriends tell me that they're still watching that. I'm like, I how? It's just pain <laughs> every Wednesday at eight. It's just trauma. <laughs> like I can't I can't be a part of this with you. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's you know the thing about Get Out that I think people forget is that he also, I mean, it's like a it's like a like a pop like a blockbuster. You know, like he mm-hmm. directs it like in a way that's for like a mass audience. It's not. I mean, I don't know. I haven't seen this one. I haven't watched The Handmaid's Tale, so I don't know. But don't. like, but like, Get Out is directed, um, and it's effective because it's directed like a blockbuster. It's supposed to appeal to a mass audience, hmm. um, which kind of d- changes up like how it's how it's kind of produced. And I think that that's, and I think that it kind of gets lost that the message is super effective, but it's also incredibly effective because it's being it's under the you know, under the the guise of like this blockbuster popular movie right i i would also say though get out like definitely had moments that i saw get out in the theater um and there were definitely moments watching it where i felt like white people and black people were having different responses to what was happening on the screen and i Mm -hmm. thought that that was really interesting but i think in this and two distant strangers it's too close i don't i don't know it's just too much like pure trauma like it's just really really brutal like Mm -hmm. it slows down every time this young man gets killed um i think the first time he is choked to death and it is very very slow you know you're hearing his like last breath and then i don't know it just it zooms in too much and like and get out the moment where um where the cop pulls up at the end Mm -hmm. um i remember (laughs) <laughs> I remember like gasping when mm-hmm. the cop lights pull up, you know, but like white people in the audience didn't have that same reaction. Like mm-hmm. everyone black near me was like, no, man, like, are you kidding me? Like after all of this. And I remember exactly like white people were like, oh, this is where everything like turns out. Okay. Yeah. I feel like two distant strangers doesn't have that. And maybe it's because society is in a different place. Or just it's not written the same way, but all of it is just just bad feelings mm. the whole time. It reminds me of, and something that I haven't watched again for this reason, is Them, that new show on yeah. Amazon. Like, I'm just not, I'm, I'm not down for that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to see black drama on top of black drama mixed with, like, a little bit of paranormal horror. Because why not? <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, how and how long? To, you said Two Distant Strangers is is a short. Yeah, it's like thirty minutes, I think. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. It's really quick. Um, Not quick enough, clearly. No, no. I'm trying to remember what the name of the song was that ended it because mm-hmm. it stuck with me. Because again, it was like a rom com type of ending song that was like the theme was like the things will never change but it's got this very happy like our love will never change vibe mm-hmm. but you just watch this man get shot like a hundred times in a row so the vibe is different obviously you know mm. i wish i could remember what the song was it's a very it's a huge popular song but it's escaping me right now yeah well i think it's kind of interesting oh sorry go ahead no you're sorry. good um i guess like I can't remember, maybe it was when we talked about Palm Springs, but like the idea of kind of this, the, the like Groundhog Day type movie being kind of an emergent like subgenre uh, that's really proliferated recently. And the, I, I didn't, you know, I haven't seen this movie either, but like this strikes me as like the most serious subject matter for that kind of thing. I mean, there's been like movies that had the structure that weren't like strictly comedies like a before i fall right that was yeah, like a yeah. teen like a teen dramedy kind of thing that was like more heavy on the drama for sure um and i i do wonder if like you know this is like kind of pushing at like the limits of just this genre like there is a sort of like inherent like existential comedy kind of element to like the the kind of time loop stories and i wonder if that structure just can't can't handle like material that's as like traumatic and like deeply serious as like, you know, police brutality and and police racism is, um, having not seen it, I'm, I'm just kind of idly musing. No. Um, Cause it is, 
kind of like a provocative way to tell that story, I guess. Yeah, no, you're because you think of also another example is um, Edge of Tomorrow, the the Tom Cruise Emily Blunt movie, and that one's kind of it's not you know <clears throat> nearly as traumatic, but it's it's jarring because it is him kind of being not viciously, but I mean, he gets, keeps getting like shot or hit with stuff to in dying over and over and over again. And the way that they film it is it's very like visceral where you can kind of feel the impact to a degree. And I, you know, I, th- I, I think I agree, you know, something like Palm Springs or even the original groundhog day where it's played to comedic effects. <laughs> um, it's a little bit easier to kind of deal with like the, the quick, you know the quick switch from the you know this time loop to this time loop um but then when it becomes you know a little when it becomes a little bit more violent um i don't know i, I think i agree like that that transition it kind of it gains a different punch that i think becomes a little bit a little too uh too much so um, well, Two Distant Strangers, it is, I believe, on, you said on Netflix? Mm-hmm. It is on Netflix. It's on Netflix. Um, Michael, I'm going to wrap up part one with you. Sure. Um, so I watched a movie that I guess first debuted at a, the Berlin Film Festival in 2019, but I remember hearing about it for the first time last year um, it, when, you know, a bunch of movies were kind of being pushed through, um, like, digital cinemas um, is when I, I first heard this. Um, when, so I guess I would consider this a 2020 movie. Um, and this is the movie 14, uh, which is directed by the film critic slash filmmaker uh, Dan Sallett, S-A-L-L-I-T-T. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his his name right. But anyway, uh, this was my first movie I'd seen of his, although all the reviews that I've looked up mentioned uh, his movie, The Unspeakable Act, um, which is from like about 10 years ago, I think. Um, but at any rate, this is kind of like a, like a micro-budget indie movie that definitely like has a lot of the aesthetic like trappings of like a, like mumblecore, like that sort of thing where you have like, uh, and even the plot, like as it begins, kind of feels mumblecore-ish, right? You have like two 20-something-year-old ladies uh, living in New York. One is like an aspiring writer. The other is a social worker. And they're kind of like, you know, living their New York life um, in like Brooklyn, I think. Um, and so like... Um, as I like started watching this movie, I felt myself kind of settling into like the comforting rhythms of like what that kind of movie uh, is like. So, you know, immediately I'm called to mind like Francis Ha or, or other movies that have focused on like young people and especially like, you know, female friendship between young women. Um, Cause the idea is that these two ladies um, have been friends since middle school. Right. And so through um, that, they, they kind of have this long relationship that, um, we're, we're coming in the midpoint of, um, with them being in their twenties. Um, but eventually like it starts to become clear that the movie's ambitions are maybe a little bit bigger than, you know, what your kind of New York indie movie, um, about 20 somethings in New York might be, um, because you start getting these time jumps. And at first it's not clear that they are time jumps. Um, you'll see like a transition from scene to scene and it's not clear how much further in the future it is because they're still living at the same stage of their life. And maybe the only thing that has changed is, um, one of their boyfriends or something like that. Um, but then there keeps being more and more of these until you realize that like this movie is going through perhaps like maybe the entire movie takes place over perhaps a decade. Um, it, it ends up being like quite a long time, um, that this movie covers and over the course of those like scenes that you see of the friendship, um, cause most of the movie is disconnected scenes. There's not really an overarching plot in the sense of one, uh, event leading to the next. Um, it is mostly like a series of little vignettes, um, where you see these two girls interacting and they eventually kind of drift in and out of each other's lives. Um, as a lot of friendships do, I guess, eventually as people like age and have kids and things like that. Um, but it ends up being extremely, um, tragic and, and really moving in this kind of like, uh, meditation on like, first of all, like, 
uh, friendship over time and how that, you know, friendship just kind of can fray and unravel in ways that aren't particularly dramatic. You know, it's not like they have a falling out, but they drift into different stages of life, but also like what happens when a close friend or former close friend of yours begins to increasingly, you know, uh, kind of get washed up on the rocks, you know, and have, you know, very visible like mental health issues or, or issues with addiction or things like that. Um, and it ends up being like a fairly serious and, and really, uh, like extremely, um, like sad movie by the end, which like, if you know that going in, like, you know, you can see the seeds, um, being sown. But when I went in, I was kind of approaching it. Like the first few scenes taught me to approach it, um, which were to kind of view this as like a, you know, like I described before, like Francis Ha or something like that. It ends up being like very, you know, much, a much more serious exploration of like serious in terms of what happens to these characters than Francis Ha. Um, and, uh, it's, it's actually really good. I know that that sounds like a bummer when I describe it and it is a bummer, but I think like it is getting at some like really interesting ideas, uh, and compressing them really, really well. Like it doesn't, the movie's like 90 minutes or something. Um, but it doesn't feel like the movie is unduly compressed. It feels like you've been given these really judiciously chosen scenes that, like I said, don't seem to amount to much at first, but eventually create this really rich tapestry of this relationship. Um, and specifically, the movie is grounded in one of the lady's points of view as well, um, the, the one who ends up like having the more stable life going on. Um, and so you also get this really interesting tension in which, which like is definitely going to be familiar to anyone who's had a friendship like this, where there is a real exhaustion with bailing the friend out of situations or having the friend flake out on things that you guys establish. And eventually like it, you know, becomes, uh, incompatible with, with life. If you like have, you know, you, you start having kids or, uh, something like that. And I think that that's a tension that I don't see explored very much in movies. You know, we, we see a lot of movies about like kind of friends drifting apart um, or about like people growing old into parenthood or, in, you know, struggling to find a job or, or things like that. But the specific dynamic of this in which like one friend is essentially like a, uh, what's the word? Like, like, well, like one friend is codependent on the other but the person, the other person doesn't share that same dynamic with the other person is like a really interesting and, and heartbreaking dynamic that I think is really good. Um, the two actresses in this are um, Tally Metal uh, and Norma Cooling. I don't know if I'm pronouncing their names right, but they're both like excellent. Um, other parts of the movie maybe betray like some of the uh, like micro budget, like mumble quarry stuff. There's some kind of mannered acting and some of this stuff feels a little stilted. Like some of these movies tend to, but like the core duo is just really, really excellent on screen. Um, and, uh, really do a good job of just working out the emotions of the characters and also like really convincingly showing characters age up, even though there's not a lot of like makeup or, uh, anything like that to, or, or even like really wardrobe changes to, sh to indicate that they're aging, you know, it's all communicated through the writing and acting, like what stage of life that they're in. Um, and it's, it's done really well. Um, it's out on DVD now. Uh, Grasshopper is distributing it. I think you can also rent it. Um, but otherwise, I you probably. I, I mean, I guess those are the only ways you can encounter a movie now. But uh, this, the you know, for Knox Villians actually watching this movie made me kind of miss the uh, the public cinema a lot because this is exactly the kind of movie that would have played, uh, you know, a public cinema showing. You know, a, a festival movie that definitely wasn't going to make the rounds to like you know the the kind of art house like mainstream art house circuit like a like the regal you know art house movie in knoxville or, or something like that um but that also you know has you know really real spark and an interesting perspective um and so watching this i you know kind of uh felt like i i in a bygone era, like bygone meaning a couple of years ago, I could have probably <laughs> seen this in Knoxville at like the KMA or, um, you know, in a scruffy city hall or something like that. Um, but unfortunately, uh, they're not at that stage anymore. So, uh, if, uh, 
our public cinema folks are listening. We miss you. And I would have liked to Darren, if you're this. listening. <laughs> yeah, Darren, <laughs> bring it back. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, I, I I recommend this movie. It's a it's a bad time, but it's a good bad time. <laughs> that's a nice that's a nice you know way to put it. Um, well, the good thing about Grasshopper is a, a lot of their movies they usually put them on Canopy, so maybe it'll show up there. Yeah, it could be, could be. So, well, cool. Well, we're gonna take a quick break, and then we will be back talking Beyonce's Lemonade after this. Cinematary listeners, this is your favorite Filipino podcaster, Jessica Carr. I'm here to let you know about a couple of things that Cinematary offers that you might not know about. First, if you're a fan of what Cinematary is doing, please consider joining us on Patreon. Remember when we weren't clamoring for your dollars? Or now we're just clamoring for five of your dollars. So please help us and donate to our Patreon, and then you'll get exclusive content from our staff, including our film theory and chill series where a panel takes a piece of theory each month and deconstructs it before diving into whatever topic is on their mind from the past week. The $5 each month is investment in the website and the podcast, and it goes solely to paying our writers for the reviews each week. So please consider doing it. It's only $5. If you missed an episode of Cinematary or a piece of writing we've had, you should consider signing up for our free newsletter. Each Sunday, we send out a note with the latest podcast episode, piece of Patreon content, and the last two reviews that we've written at Cinematary.com. It's perfect for those of you who are interested in what's happening and it makes sure that you don't miss a single Cinematary review. Finally, the easiest thing that you can do to help us is to please, please give us a rating and review on iTunes, Spotify, or whatever else you're using to listen to the show. This helps us get more eyeballs and ears on the podcast and the website, and it helps the people know about Cinematary, which is really what we're here for. So to recap, consider donating to our Patreon, sign up for the free newsletter, and give us a rating or review. We would really appreciate if you could do these things. Thank you for listening, and now back to the show. Y'all haters corny with that Illuminati mess. Paparazzi catch my fly and my cocky fresh. I'm so reckless when I rock my Givenchy dress. I'm so possessive, so I rock his rock necklaces. My daddy Alabama, mama Louisiana. You mix that Negro with that Creole, make a Texas Bama. And we're back with part two of episode 351 of Cinematary. And this part will be concluding our music video series with 2016's Lemonade by Beyonce. Uh, she directed it uh, along with Khalil Joseph, to Kyle uh, Ramish, Todd Torso, Jonas Ackerlin, Melina Matsukas, and Mark Romanek. Um, they all directed different portions of the movie. The film is a companion to her 2016 album of the same name and is divided into 11 chapters titled Intuition, Denial, Anger, Apathy, Emptiness, Accountability, Reformation, Forgiveness, Resurrection, Hope, and Redemption. Uh, the film uses poetry and prose written by British Somali poet Warson Shire. The poems adapted were The Unbearable Weight of Stain, Dear Moon, How to Wear Your Mother's Lipstick, Nail Technician as Palm Reader, and For Women Who Are Difficult to Love. Uh, led by Beyonce, the film's cast includes, and I'm, I'm going to screw up a lot of these names, I'm going to be honest, uh, <laughs> Ibeyi, uh, Luau Sinbei Bonho, uh, Aman La Stenberg, uh, how do you say this, Qu- Qu- uh, Quavinzani Wallace, who, who was in Beast of the Southern Wild, which I don't know where she oh, is now. no kidding. Yeah, I didn't know um, that. yeah, I don't know where she is anymore. Hmm. So hopefully hopefully she's doing stuff. Uh, Chloe and Hal, uh, Zendaya, and... Uh, and Serena Williams. Hallie. Wait, where's Sadaya? That's the only that one too. I think. What's that? I miss Sadaya as well. Where is she? She's um when there's like the group of women with Beyonce like on the porch, she's sitting there on the porch. She's not as oh. like prominent in like the scenes as like Serena Williams or mm-hmm. uh, right. some of the others are. Oh wow. Okay. Um 
according to director Melina Matsukis, but Beyonce paid for the film portion herself uh, with writer Alexis uh, Alexis Akewo, uh, Akewo uh, adding that it allowed, quote, for a kind of artistic control that few black artists have experienced. Uh, Matsukis, who directed the formation portion, added in, the, in an interview with The New Yorker that, uh, quote, Beyonce wanted to show the historical impact of slavery on black love and what it has done to the black family and black men and women, how we're almost socialized not to be together. She added that writers Toni Morrison, Maya Angelou, and Octavia Butler inspired her in the creation of the video for Formation. Quote, I wanted to show this is black people. We triumph, we suffer, we're drowning, we're being beaten, we're dancing, we're eating, and we're still here. The film, uh, the video was filmed in two days between rehearsals for the 2016 Super Bowl halftime show. So, um, Wait, are you talking about just the formation or the whole... Uh, just formation. Okay, I was like, holy yeah. cow, this whole thing was made in no, 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 just <laughs> okay. formation, which still is impressive. Yeah, for sure. Uh, um, on working with Beyonce on the film compared to the album, uh, Milo X told uh, Pitchfork in 2016, quote, it's pretty much the same. She's hands-on with everything. She gives direction on everything and is very involved with the whole process. It's inspiring to see an artist on that level be able to just still have an eye for certain things and an ear. Even though she's considered famous, the public doesn't necessarily give them that extra credit that once you're famous or rich, it gets easier. But I've seen firsthand it doesn't get easier. It gets harder and you have to be way more on point with everything you do. Uh, everything uh, to do and she's definitely involved with the whole process and we would just sit down and go over with different things uh, and different scenes and sounds and kind of put it together piece by piece Rolling Stone in 2016 said, Taken as a whole, the new film may be a state-of-the-art piece of advertising. Seven directors worked on the project, including Knowles herself, but it's also a substantial artistic statement strong enough to be consumed without hearing the album it promotes. Uh, The New York in 2016 said, Lemonade is Beyonce's bid to be an artist without losing her commercial appeal in a world where pop stardom isn't what it once was. She's smart enough to know that her audience requires something more, some fortifying authenticity in the tracks on Lemonade are the first she's written that bear repeat, repeated listening. And in 2019, Vox said, most of the movies that showed up at the multiplex this decade are already utterly forgotten. Lemonade, I've no doubt, will outlast us. On that note, let's talk a little bit about Lemonade, um, which I know we've talked a little bit through the series. It's kind of a... Um, kind of a perfect way to end just because it feels like a very completed version of a lot of the things that we've covered over the course of this music video series. Um, but Ariel, I wanted to start with you. Um, just kind of what is your, I know, you know, I guess what is your, what is your experience? What is your, um, you know, familiarity with Beyonce and Lemonade and kind of what did, what was that like when you were watching it when it first came out in 2016, uh, kind of as this event on HBO? Um, so I, I definitely approached it as a longtime Beyonce fan, as like a super fan who wants to know everything about Beyonce's life, but also understands that she is, um, the older and longer that she's been an artist, the better she is at protecting that stuff Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, and kind of hiding it away. Um, so knowing that whatever I got was going to be very stylized and very Beyonce and very like taking back the headlines. Um, I was not prepared. (laughs) I was not prepared at all for how, um, how direct it was going to be, how Mm -hmm. like before watching it, Jay-Z cheating still felt kind of like a rumor, like an internet rumor. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, there was still that possibility of like, well, we've seen this elevator scene. Maybe Solange was just kind of a little turned up that night. And like, Mm -hmm. sure, maybe Jay-Z said something crazy, but like, we're not actually sure that like the cheating happened. Um, So I remember watching it in this apartment, actually, (laughs) that long ago. (laughs) And just being like, wow, like we... I felt like I, even if I couldn't understand it as a Beyonce fan, Mm -hmm. especially the getting back together with Jay-Z at the end, I felt like I understood (laughs) the story, Mm -hmm. like in a way that like Beyonce doesn't give to her fans very often. I think about um, that Oprah interview that she did years after her miscarriage, where Mm -hmm. like no one even knew that she had been pregnant. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And she's like crying on the couch with Oprah. And like, that's kind of like her style, right? Like something will happen that's intensely personal. Um, and, you know, we'll kind of see things in the headlines like, oh, Beyonce's hanging out with Jay-Z or Beyonce looks a little tired mm-hmm. or Beyonce hasn't dropped an album in, you know, so and so years. But the way that she's able to like reclaim her narrative as an artist is just, I think it's really like unmatched. Um I was really surprised to see or hear Warsenshire poems in it. I was already a fan of that poet from like my Tumblr days. Uh, <laughs> she was very popular on Tumblr. Um, so to kind of hear those, to hear those poems come, th- like, I don't know, just to know that Beyonce was listening to the same poetry that I was listening to was already like really, really cool. Yeah. Um, and I think that this narrative of a woman real like first understanding that she's being cheated on before anything's been said that intuition part really really fits well if you read Warson Shire's work it's all about like a woman's intuition um, and all sorts of things relationships um, understanding your mother and like the things she's trying to teach you about being a woman um, so I like that I don't know I like knowing that Beyonce's a reader and that she's an artist that spans genres you know and can definitely connect themes in different genres um we were talking about this earlier i was definitely the hold up beyonce for halloween in the yellow dress with the baseball bat i wish i had a photo because um it was a perfect costume um but that's probably my mm, it's hard to pick a favorite it really is i was gonna say that was my favorite part of lemonade it's definitely the most until you get to formation at the end it's definitely the most entertaining because uh (laughs) she has a bat yeah and, and it's also just very <laughs> it has it's, the biggest like to see yeah it's very kinetic like i've seen it parodied so many times yeah but it also like you watch like the actual video like that actual portion in the film and it's the most like kinetic because a lot of the other things um feel more indebted to like documentary or even avant-garde to a degree it's much more like ethereal kind of moving through these like different planes and stories and timelines Mm -hmm. and that one feels like very like in your face directly like speaking to the audience um it's like the most conventional but also the most entertaining right right i really like the way it starts also because it comes through that intuition part of the video where she's like underwater and it's that very heavy into the Worcestershire poetry um and then she bursts through those doors and it's like I don't know you just get that feeling of the moment when you've been thinking about something in a relationship for a really long time you're like should I say something am I gonna ask like am I just gonna keep it to myself and all of the poetry that she's reading in that moment is literally like I tried to be quieter. I tried to stuff it down. Like I tried to do all these things and you see her underwater. And then when she opens the floodgates in that like yellow dress, it's kind of like, I don't know. She's visually very, very pleasing. The water comes out and now Mm. she's pissed and she's got hot sauce in her bag and (laughs) and all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, Michael, what about you? What did, what did your, uh, What's your history with Lemonade? I so I don't have HBO, so I didn't watch like the original um, drop of this the film, which I guess either immediately was this immediately before the album was released or coinciding the album's release. Like it, it was, it was a really quick one two thing, right? Yeah, I think um, the album was like the next day or within that week. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, and I was, um, I mean, I. I was, I mean, I'm still a fairly casual Beyonce fan, and I was at the time. I've, I've, I like have gotten all of her albums since then, and um, really like understand like the scope of her career better. But at the time, like I definitely had mostly just heard, um, you know, her her you know famous songs and kind of vaguely knew like her, um, like the the Sasha Fierce like concept and like different things like that. Um, but this like. I remember like people at work talking about this the next day and after it aired and stuff, I was like, Oh, that sounds interesting. And so then whenever it was put on title, I used my title free trial, um, to watch it. Um, which in retrospect, a lot of my friends use their title free trial to listen to the life of Pablo. Um, and I used it on, uh, on Beyonce. And I, I think that like history has, has validated that choice. Um, 
but uh and i was i was blown away at the time like i, I thought it was like incredible uh, i was really watching a lot of like andre tarkovsky movies and like to me like this felt like what tarkovsky is doing in mirror um which is like not a music video movie of course but it is a movie in which like there's a lot of poetry um that is spoken and using a non-linear um editing style and stuff and so i was like really enthralled with it and i i'd, I'd have to go back and look at my favorite movies of 2016 like what i said what the actual ranking was but i want to say this was like top five i put i decided like it was one of my favorite movies then um and uh i, I just thought it was was great um and th- i i listened to or i watched this before i listened to the album as well so like to i think it was rolling stone or one of the critics that you mentioned at the top sack said that this stands alone outside of the album and i will um 100 co-sign that because uh that was definitely my experience um and i i got the album um on the strength of the video and i think that um uh, the movie is a, definitely a more coherent statement than the album. I have listened to the album a ton since then, and I think that's changed how I feel about the movie, and we can maybe talk about that um, later on, because uh, returning to it, I definitely felt... Uh, I, I noticed more of the, of the, like, okay, this is the hold-up music video, and this is the, like, Daddy Weston section, and, and stuff that I wasn't really aware of when I watched it the first time, and it felt like this kind of fluid stream of consciousness thing. Um, and so having listened to the music a lot more, like some of the individual songs stood out to me more this time, um, but it still is like extremely cool and, and exceptionally ambitious. And probably, uh, unless I'm missing something like, like by a very large margin, like the most successful, like visual album, like, you know, since that's become a thing that people have tried to do. Yeah. No, I think that's a good point, like kind of looking at like watching the film and then going to the album and then kind of going back. And I think also, especially like this in context to, uh, you know, the mode that Beyonce has been kind of working in since then, because you think, you know, she she kind of plays with this as well with homecoming she did the same thing on a kind of grander on a much more like technically grander scale with black is king for for disney plus um and it's so it's kind of interesting to watch this now with those two come out you know because they're all they're all kind of different things you know like lemonade feels like the most pure um like artistically focused version um i think i still prefer homecoming because there's something about like the energy of like the live performance Mm -hmm. interspersed with like the more films you know like she's placing those in there like that that kind of interests me a little bit more um and then black is king doesn't really do much for me because it's just so it's um it's it's obsessed with the visuals and a at least to me in a less interesting way than this movie is obsessed with the visuals because i kind of agree with you michael where um this feels very much like in line with like a, a tarkovsky movie and i think that the interesting thing about beyonce as an artist um to ariel's point is that she's she's like engaged in interesting things she's reading and watching like she she like the stuff that she's kind of working off of is is pretty interesting it's not mm-hmm. like um it's not just like garden variety stuff it's like no she's actually seeking out like inner like the people she has on her directing list shows that she's not just watching whatever right. you know she's clearly like in like looking at stuff in a in an interesting way I will say too, um, in in terms of like Zach, you mentioned like Homecoming and then Black is King and um, like those I those do form sort of like a rough trilogy, not just for what you were mentioning, Zach, but also like the period of time and and maybe Ariel can talk more to this since you're you know the the expert here, but I definitely feel like since I've become more acquainted with like Beyonce's back catalog, um, there's a definite shift in how Beyonce an art as an artist presents herself to um through her music so you know you have like early stuff um that's like you know very much in the pop R&B realm like you know Crazy in Love and of course like Destiny's Child and stuff like that in which like Beyonce is playing you know a certain 
there, there's like a certain type that is like a, a riff on like the pop diva. And I feel like that with maybe starting with her self-titled, but definitely like fully embodied in Lemonade is like this idea of Beyonce as like an icon and not, not simply like an icon in the sense that she's famous, but I mean like literally iconic in like the religious sense of like being presented as this like uh, larger than life figure, like in the way that you might have seen like uh, certain like David Bowie iterations or something like that, where like Beyonce is embodying a character that is meant to be like um, symbolically resonant and um, homecoming and black is King definitely trade on that as well. Like this idea as Beyonce as a sort of like uh, almost, almost like metaphysical presence. That's maybe not exactly the right word for it, but like Beyonce as like a, like a person who is like on an elevated plane and meant to symbolize like ideas and not like this feels like the moment in which like she like the the form of her uh art like truly embodied like that ethos of like Beyonce as that and it's interesting that that's also at the same time at which like Ariel you mentioned that it has um some more personal elements than might have been um in previous ones and then of course with uh, Homecoming as well the home video footage um are like a contrast to the Beyonce you see on the stage who is like uh like almost like an unattainable ideal um that is also like a kind of like symbolic um, figure in some ways. I don't know. I'm, I'm rambling at this point, but there, there is something that feels like, like there's a trilogy that has like marked a shift in uh, like Beyonce's presentation in a way that I think is really interesting. Yeah. I think, um, I think you're right. And I think it definitely maybe started or became something that I noticed, especially with self-titled like that, um, dropping an album with no promo at the time felt at least to me really crazy and like crazy to the point like I had no idea I don't know like the fact that it reached me at all with no promo was kind of um I don't know like magical <laughs> at the time I guess and I think a lot of her fans were um were really hype on that album. I think it has to do with that drop as well as just probably coming more into herself as an artist. I feel like she was, um, I'm, I'm guessing, but I'm thinking that this was self-titled was around her like early thirties maybe. And I feel like this was a, a shift more into I don't know, like being less of a pop princess and mo that's for everyone and claiming more um, her cultural identity. Like self-titled was the first time that people were like hashtagging, like cussing Beyonce and like black Beyonce and like all this stuff. And it's like, well, she's been black for like a, a minute, <laughs> like for a very long time. <laughs> but I do think that self-titled marked this sort of like stepping out of this almost like bubblegum pop that anyone can listen to. Yeah. Um, and with formation, it just got even bigger. I remember the, um, um, sorry, I'm making sure Mary Jane's not messing with the camera. <laughs> I remember SNL had that skit when formation came out where it was just like people listening to it for the first time and like running around the streets and in their offices, like Beyonce is black. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> and it really like, I feel like when artists start talking about bigger issues in that way especially black artists they kind of get that legend status um this is like maybe not the this is not the best um comparison at all but like people like tupac mm -hmm. tupac's great i'm not saying that his songs and his like style is not good but tupac became big when he was rapping about like you know treating women fairly and like issues in the black community and like mm -hmm kind of forgot that he was rapping about the same stuff that everybody else was rapping about before then. Like, he was calling everybody bitches and hoes like that. It was just like a shift that put him on a pedestal, basically. Um, and maybe it has to do with her being a mom. 
also. I'm really interested to see what direction she's going in next as someone who has still not seen her live um, and would love to, <laughs> really, really love to. I'm scared that she's in movie directing slash mom mode. And I'm very curious to see what, if any, music that we get next. You know, I think I'm going to see a lot of Lion Kings, basically. Do you remember, uh, speaking about, like, this sort of, like, shift, like, um, when was the, um, because, because one of the, I I remember, like, another thing that kind of caused a splash as far as, like, Beyonce kind of taking control of her image and things like that was her, um, maternity photos. Do you remember those? Um, like the, and and they were really, really evocative of, like, um, I'm, I'm struggling to remember exactly what they were, but lots lots of, like, flowers and, like, fertility imagery, but they were, like, extremely striking photos. Do you remember those? Yeah, that was with, um, that was definitely with the twins. That was after Blue. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. I, so, I mean, I, I love the pictures in just the, like, oh my gosh, Beyonce looks really pretty kind of way, but I do remember a lot of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, think pieces around that time mm-hmm. talking about, like, you know, Beyonce's not a god just because she, like, had kids. You know, like, women do this, like, all the time. And kind of, like, shaming that um, that pedestal that people had put her on. Um, but again, I, I could tie that back to her being vulnerable in those moments. Because to me, what I remember from her pregnancy is, like, all of the health complications that she had. And then her being, like... You know, it took a while because she's Beyonce, but like afterwards her being really open about like black maternal health and um, it was kind of around the same time as Serena Williams was talking about her complications in pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if mixed with like that vulnerability and that like speaking on black issues, if just, I don't know, there's, it, there's become like this nothing can touch Beyonce vibe right like from miscarriage cheating husband um people trying to like cancel beyonce because she said black lives matter like it's just for a long time it was stacking up it's like she's untouchable and no matter what you throw at her the the art's gonna be awesome she's gonna she's gonna sell all the time you know yeah i think that's what's really interesting to me about like her most recent stuff is that i think there is an element of it of it really leaning into um, the untouchability. Like there's, um, you know, the the lines, and I think like, especially some of the self-titled stuff in in like Homecoming, like the self material from self-titled and Homecoming, you know, with like um, the song Flawless, like kind of exploits that, or not exploits, but explores that dynamic of like, you know, I woke up like this, but she's Beyonce, right? Um, and, you know, and of course is gorgeous, but at the same time, like, uh, exploring like the idea of like being simultaneously this figure that seems untouchable, but also s- having having human problems that make her like very like intensely relatable in some ways as well. And I think like that there's that really interesting tension in like her more recent work where she is like seems like self aware of like some of the like untouchability status or like the the platform or or even like the the like you know her her wealth and success and how that intersects with the fact that she has these universal experiences of like uh black womanhood um which and i i think that that's just like a really interesting idea and like lemonade explores that a lot like to wrap it around like i remember a bunch of people or some people at least being a little bit confused about like why the movie um, goes so much um, into exploring like slavery and the history of racism and stuff when this is like quote unquote like a divorce album or a, like a you know whatever and I think that that's part of that whole project which is that like the the fact of like these experiences ties her into a larger tradition um, and despite the fact that you know she is like you know one of the you know richest and most powerful people like she fits into this larger tradition that, that that is like a lot more collective than like you might assume of a like a, a billionaire pop star um and I, I think that's super interesting well you you get that in the scenes she has the uh the kind of more 
uh, familial scenes where you have like the kids running around the streets and the mothers and women just kind of walking around. I think that's you're introduced to them with the um, where you have Malcolm X speaking about the black woman uh, and mm-hmm. like his speech about that while um, while you see kind of just the scenes in the streets and there's there is kind of like this. Um, unifying feeling around that. One thing I was thinking about um, while watching this as well is this is a film that's predominantly filmed in and out of New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, and you have a lot of this imagery of um, of like being immersed with water and walking into water. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, you kind of, and you, at least in terms of like the, especially modern history of New Orleans, you think of like Hurricane Katrina and what that did to, you know, mostly the black population in New Orleans, just the kind of displacement and uh, loss of identity through that because a lot of their identity, a lot of their heritage, a lot of their, you know, life was just washed away by the water and they were kind of cast off and kind of wandering from there. Um, And it's, you know, she doesn't necessarily totally engage with that concept, you know, with that whole, with that, with with that, but like at at the same time, she's, she kind of um, evokes it with the imagery in a way that um, kind of harkens back to what we were talking about earlier, that like she, she understands stuff on like a cinematic level in a way that may, that mm-hmm. she's able to engage with many different things while not you know necessarily talking about them. She's also like using using movie tip tricks to like you know <laughs> engage with it in, in a more visual sense. Yeah, I find it really interesting, especially what you guys are saying about her um, like her status is like not quite religious figure but as obviously like this thing this thing to be revered right and i was thinking because we just rewatched it um before recording um i'd forgotten but she actually like flashes on the screen for a moment um what does it say i am not god yeah or something like that and i wonder if she yeah i don't know i wonder if she's uncomfortable with the with those um with those connections you know like it it, sometimes it it could feel like i'm I'm so glad that i have fans and i'm um i'm glad that you guys are listening but let's focus on the fact that the story that i'm trying to tell is universal um or it is at least something that a lot of black women can um relate to you know well well, that was definitely something that came up with black is king because i saw a lot of pieces related to that kind of circling in on you know you have this incredibly wealthy person Mm -hmm. kind of reveling in this um afrofuturism you know because a lot of that film is taking place with like they have like these um larger than life kind of royal black figures Mm -hmm. um and i saw a lot of the the criticisms of it was that like this is not not necessarily like her story to t- it wasn't her story it, you know she right. she can didn't have it she wasn't her story to tell but also just she kind of um i don't know just just the, the just like the kind of the privilege that she came from even though like she's she's trying to engage it through like kind of the black diaspora mm-hmm. but there's also like that whole class thing um you know that that, i was thinking about that as well just kind of how people read that film and kind of her status um but i don't know that was also a very like complicated (laughs) complicated (laughs) uh uh whole issue um it's gorgeous like it's gorgeous a a gorgeous thing to watch but yeah, I, I prefer Beyonce's personal, and maybe it's just because I'm not as into Lion King as I, <laughs> I used right, to be. Yeah. Maybe that's what it is, but I definitely prefer her personal narratives um, over that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and we we talked a little bit about formation and um, a few of the. Other, is there any other of the portions that kind of stick out to y'all? Um, you know, I think. The one I forgot what the song is, but the one where they're in the 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 plantation home and it's like her and Serena Williams, like that. Just the. Sorry. Is that Daddy Lessons? Is that it? 
I think with Serena Williams, it's sorry. She's walking around. Sorry. She's twerking on the throne. And stuff. Yeah, oh, <laughs> just okay. like in ter- yeah. just in terms of like the the kind of set design, the layout of that, like that one is also probably one of the more evocative ones, just because the way that they, they kind of like position the camera in that. A lot of the times they position it kind of far back, and you like have like Beyonce and Serena Williams like kind of um, like somewhat in the back of the frame. Um, and then it'll like cut to a more like closer and it's like it's like kind of constantly playing with like this back and forth motion um that one's that one's really impressive to me and then the one where she predominantly is like in the the limo and she has like the the big kind of hat on and um the i believe kalika law worked on it a little bit where you have like the red lights and like the people kind of on the street rushing by the limo um hmm. those two kind of stand out to me as the more impressive um impressive sequences of the film one thing that i noticed and only having like just recently watched like the um the hype williams um films or music videos from a few weeks ago but the uh the sequence that is uh for don't hurt yourself um struck me as like very hype Williams to me um or at least like maybe indebted to that like kind of 90s like hip-hop music video like uh scene because you've got the like low to the ground camera where the performer is kind of looking down into the camera and directly looking at it um you have a lot of the like kind of kind of interesting abstractions you've got I think that ends with like an explosion or something like that in a way but but also in a the environment is is slightly like uh, well, I already said like abstracted in a way that like I don't know it kind of felt like what uh, some of those hype Williams movies in the nineties um, were doing, um, and I thought that was interesting because as I mentioned, like watching this the second time, I became much more aware of how much this was. Um, despite like being a, a whole film, like it still is a sequence of music videos that are kind of broken up by poetry interludes. Um, and so now knowing the songs, I could tell where the individual like songs would begin, or I could anticipate that. Um, and so I was struck, like some of these are like extremely off format for music videos. Um, like the, the one that you were talking about, Zach, like feels, feels kind of off format. And then some of these definitely like hold up and uh, don't hurt yourself, particularly feel like you could uh, excerpt these um, at, and just present them as standalone videos, uh, Formation as well, which I guess Formation's video was released separately. Right? That, 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 that one to me was the most music video of all of them. Yeah. Like that one felt like a, like a standalone music video. The other ones felt like they kind of played into one another to a degree yeah, um, and it all, but it all formation connects. felt like a standalone thing yeah well in formations like the credits are rolling anyway so it, it definitely feels of its own i mean they all connect um but i guess i was just saying that like it i can feel like where the movie is like kind of shifting gears as the tracks shift um which is of course like what an album is supposed to do anyway um but it struck out to me a lot more um the like some of this feels a little bit fragmentary um which, which I think was cool, but I remember my memory of the movie, having watched it without the album, was that it was this, like, really interesting, like, stream of consciousness, like, hour-long, like, art film, basically. And it's not, not that, but now that I know the individual songs, it's easier for me to pick out the pieces, um, which... I don't know. I, I guess honestly, I've preferred before I listened to the album, like this feeling of like, I don't really know what's happening next. And I'm not clear the overall direction of this. And I'm kind of just like caught up in this whole thing. And the familiarity with the album has demystified the movie for me a little bit, um, which I think it is still really good. But I thought that was interesting. I wasn't expecting that at all. Um, but I definitely was like having heard the album like I my brain was already, you know, as each song was ending, my brain knew like, okay, we're going to then head into this next one and this next one. Um, and, and I, I missed the, some of the mystery, but the pieces are amazing still. I agree. Um, that's one thing I was thinking about, you know, as we've gone through this series, we've seen kind of a progression of how music videos have changed and there's always been, I think we talked about it a lot in the first episode where there's just like this kind of, a lot more freedom of expression to kind of to play around and test things, especially in those early, in those early music videos. Um, Hype Williams did the same thing where he really just grasped 
um, the the star power and the persona of the people, whether it was DMX or Mariah Carey or mm-hmm. just any of the, you know, even Kanye West, just any of the people who are like he was filming, like he was just able to kind of capture their um, their persona and just their star power at that moment in time and like really utilize that for the for the music video. And it seems like um, going back to the point I made at the, at the top that like Lemonade is kind of the perfect encapsulation of all of that because there does feel to be, be a lot of that um, a lot of that kind of uh, form bending uh, you know play to it like she's constantly kind of playing around with the direction of this film but at the same time um, she feels very like she's able to kind of capture not only just her own persona but like just the the people involved in this I mean when Serena Williams is there she's like she she's able to kind of capture what she's doing um you know, for that time, you know, like, uh, like you, you, you really feel like you're able, like you're kind of drawn in and, um, you gravitate to the, to the different, uh, faces and the different personalities that are being brought on screen in a way that, um, while it doesn't have like the necessarily the, the style comparisons always to hype Williams, it kind of, he, she kind of understands that, um, I think a lot of the essence of the music video is, playing with the form but also understanding the the persona of the Mm -hmm. artist in front um and i think this in in a way this kind of is that perfect amalgamation of all those different facets of what makes a music video a music video yeah i didn't think about that but if you go back and look at the i'm sorry video like it is and i'm not going to pretend like i remember exactly what serena williams is had going on like that year but it has the whole song has the vibe of like i don't know like a boss ass bitch who's like i'm not i'm actually not sorry (laughs) for anything which totally fits serena williams (laughs) and then later we have kind of like um younger black women coming in when she's in um i guess that's part of formation but there's also younger black women in daddy lessons too right it becomes like this generational sort of like um, tale of now what are we teaching these black women that are like coming up um, she talks a lot about um, probably one of my favorite lines in there when she's speaking is am I talking about your husband or your father um, when she has all those lines about like you know you're a magician you're here and you're not here and you act like this and we tiptoe around your feelings and that line where she says am i talking about your husband or your father it's like oh so you could be like literally any age (laughs) watching this and being like oh these are the ways that we adjust ourselves and live around like the male presence basically Mm -hmm. um and it's really really well done any any final thoughts on lemonade before we wrap up or i guess just the the music video series at large I do think it, um, I wish I had watched the, cause, um, the self-titled Beyonce album is technically like has a visual component as well. Um, I have that on CD that also, it also has the, the DVD in it. Um, I've not watched it though. Uh, Ariel, have you seen the, the like a uh, visual album for Beyonce? Um, is it a full, like album together for self-titled or is it just every song has a music video well every song has a music video but i'm not sure how much it's supposed to fit together like i said i've not seen it but um i guess my my larger point was that i was trying to say is that like i feel like lemonade is like this really interesting like touchstone because it kind of took because there had been, like, albums where every song had a music video before. There's even, like, there's, like, a Beach House album, even, that, like, has has that that concept. But, like, um, uh, Lemonade, like, draws the connection from, like, like, the whole, like, rock opera concept album, like, The Wall or whatever, and draws the line between that and, like, the contemporary, like, visual album. And I think that there's been, like, other attempts at doing something like that um, later, like, uh, when Janelle Monet did the Dirty Computer album. But, like, none of them have felt, like, as essential or as, like, completely, like, uh, embodied as what it is uh, besides Lemonade. Like, Lemonade kind of does feel like a 
like a watershed moment, at least in the history of like um, music video. And I, I think also like along those lines, and this is not the same thing because it's not a visual album, but like uh, the Kendrick Lamar videos um, that were surrounding a uh, Pimp a Butterfly, I think also have the same sort of feel to them um, where like the idea of um, music video being art film, like just kind of like the, the separation between them collapses. Um, and there is this idea that like the music video form can tell these larger, like socially conscious stories that like have these like resonant themes and stuff. Um, and that's like not been non-existent for music videos. You know, you have like, you know, Michael Jackson doing like, you know, the really long storytelling music videos and stuff like that. But like the, this feels like the moment in which like some of the avant-garde like impulses of uh, music videos or like the experimental impulses match some of those like cinematic impulses, like the, the cinematic storytelling impulses. And it, it feels like something that people have really been consciously trying to still figure out um, post Lemonade. Like I think Dirty Computer, like I mentioned, is not as successful because it hasn't really fi- it didn't really seem to have figured out like the balance between the narrative and like the the narrative thrust and like some of the like experimental avant garde impulses of a music video. But Lemonade is so interesting because it starts this whole like it starts a lot of these conversations for contemporary artists while also still being like I think like the one who's figured it out the best. Um, and I think that's a really interesting place to, that music videos are in now where digital distribution means that you don't have to, um, you know, find a, a programming slot on MTV or something like that. Um, you know, digital distribution has freed up the music video to be more than simply like the soundtrack for a song. You can you can have like these much grander ties um, and concepts. Um and I would like to imagine that this is like, you know, visionary in the sense of there's going to be more stuff like this in the future. Um, but like I said, I don't know that I've seen one that's as successful as Lemonade. So I'm, you know, maybe, maybe this is just kind of like a, like an interesting little like, you know, watershed moment where, uh, you know, it, it it simply perfected the the idea of it and. Uh, to such a degree that it's hard to replicate. I don't know. Um, I also want more Beyonce music. I'm just like, we're at this like moment in this not summer, but pre-summer where everyone's like waiting for a summer bop. mm -hmm. And I keep seeing these albums come out. DJ Khaled just dropped, you know, some (laughs) some album of like two cent songs with every rapper alive (laughs) as he does. But there's not like a summer like bop. Um, and I would love for Beyonce to swoop in and, and take that. She won't. She's told she's busy. She has like, I don't know, like organic honey on a farm right now. It's the last interview oh, wow. I read of hers. Right. But, you know. Well, she's been like doing these like feature spots, right? Like, so she was in like the Megan Thee Stallion song last year. And then she was in, uh, she was in like Mi Gente, right? Um, and things like that. So you get these little intriguing, like, glimpses of like you know here's what Beyonce is tuned into right now um and that's always interesting but those are always like with her as like just a support to another artist um and I I guess I'm kind of with Zach where I I wasn't super enthralled or I guess you too Ariel I wasn't super enthralled with Black is King but I guess that was the most recent like new Beyonce music we got um but it was so branded I I blame Disney I don't blame her (laughs) no yeah I don't either but it was you know it's it was so connected to the Lion King that it didn't feel like a fully realized. Yeah, we uh, we get music. it. You know, it's like <laughs> you had to do it. I understand. I did like the album a lot. Like, if I took the album away from the movie, and I mean the visuals were pretty, but if I'm just listening to the music, um, I could get into it. I could get into it. But once I was like, oh, this is about the Lion King, it, it was like, oh, that <laughs> yeah. that ruins it for me. Because there's, you know, there's beautiful songs where Beyonce's talking about you know, dying and the ancestors and like leaving Mm -hmm. stuff for blue and her kids. And it's like, this is like really powerful. But then you're like, just picturing like Simba. And and then like, (laughs) it's 
<laughs> well, then, well, then it cuts to like a scene where like Seth Rogen's going, oh, oh, oh. right. <laughs> that's the issue. It's Seth Rogen's fault. Yeah, that's, that, 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 that kind of ruins it when Seth Rogen and Billy Eichner are talking in the middle of the Beyonce song. Um, all right. Well, that will uh, that will wrap up this episode of Cinematary and the series on music videos. So, um, if you if you want to go back, check out. Um, we skipped for three fifty, but uh, the last few episodes we've been talking about music videos. So I recommend going back and listening to them. And we also have um, at least for the first two, we have the playlist on our YouTube channel, so you can watch along with the videos that we talked about. Um, but you can find us on Facebook uh, Facebook dot com slash Cinematary on Twitter and Instagram at handle at Cinematary, and on Letterbox at Letterbox dot com slash Cinematary, where we have. Uh, listed all the movies that we talked about in this episode also thank you to our patrons patreon.com slash cinematary thank you to cam chad newsome christina daughtry Corey willingham harry eskin candace sisson maggie ron hayes titus arthur tyler chandler and whitney rio ross thank you so much for your patronage and our patrons we're going to need you because our next series that we're going to be doing is two weeks of uh patrons choice movies so if you're a patron on patreon and you have not sent us a uh a selection because uh, if you join us, if you support us on Patreon, you get to pick a movie for us to watch. So if you've not done that, please uh, send one to us. We're going to be uh, doing two weeks of Patreon picks. So uh, let us know. Um, but until then, thank you guys for listening. We'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.